Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 20% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE9. Selling them all. He made a couple of flips. He thought his game was unlocked until the uniform man came at his door with a knock. Now he's got nothing to say. He's petrified and he's shocked. He was the king of the town. Now he's the laugh of the block. He made a couple of flips. He thought his game was unlocked until the uniform man came at his door with a knock. Now he's got nothing to say. He's petrified and he's shocked. He was the king of the town. Now he's the laugh of the Don't block. Copy that. What? Why? Don't copy that. What? What? Why? Don't copy that. What? Why? Because it's not just a copy, it's a crime. All right, good enough for me. Go, go, go. <laughs> it's frame rate. You better believe it is. You don't right, episode it is, Tom. 140. No, no compromising on what this is. Brian Brushwood, I'm Tom Merritt. Look, a lot of people are ashamed of their shows. They'll come on, you're like, I don't know what show this is. You're just here and we're watching. But no, we're just not like ashamed. We're, we're frame rate. Mm, <laughs> and Welcome you know to what frame that rate. was? That what? was, uh, oh yeah, I'm Brian Brushwood. And that was oh, yeah. uh, that was from the, uh, that was the sequel. So don't copy that floppy. Wait, and this is an official sequel? Like they think that's a good idea? Okay, now here's the weird part, right? So okay. don't copy that floppy was a hilariously misguided, extraordinarily 90s rap video that was, you know, hilarious in its own right. So they decide, uh, what, 17 years later, this came out last year, I think, to, to follow it up with a sequel that would acknowledge how hilariously, atrociously uh, uh, dated the original was. So they start off with, a, the video is a couple of guys sitting in a room while somebody's copying stuff, uploading it to a torrent site. And then they're like, you know, crazy 90s nostalgia. Remember this terrible video? And everyone's laughing at the don't copy that floppy video, right? And then, then the dude comes back and just like, he's like, yeah, man, I know I was a joke, but now I'm back with the exact same message, only I don't say floppies. And he because gets this nobody like, uses floppies. Well, the, the, okay, the, the rap is like this extraordinarily nuanced argument saying like, um, you may be ashamed of your actions in the future. What you do has consequences. Think about what you're doing and please don't copy that in whatever format that you choose. The it's forms a, of intellectual it's... property violation are very nuanced and complex. So <laughs> yes. you might want to consider all of the effects of your actions and fair use implications under the four facts as found at fairuse.stanford.edu before you copy. <laughs> And then oh. it follows up with us like, why don't you try creating new material? Then you'll understand how hard it is to make a living as a content creator when other people are ripping you off. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really an uh, we extraordinary got, we got, video. We're going to bring in Fraser Kane, uh, publisher of Universe Today. He is our guest today because I want to hear what he thinks of this. How are you doing, Fraser? It's good. Uh, yeah, so like, unless you want to release your material in some kind of Creative Commons license, and there's many options that you can choose from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't. It's yeah. amazing. Uh, unless yeah. what we're trying to say is that copyright is complicated. So don't <laughs> copy that floppy unless it's Just don't use. do anything. It starts to become the YOLO song from Saturday Night yeah. Live. Don't leave the house. Yes. Just too dangerous. If you watch cable, you're probably safe. Yeah. Uh, uh, by amazing. the way, Frame Rate, if anyone doesn't know, is the show that thinks you ought to be able to watch what you want, when you want, where you want. And we aim to give you the info to help do that. So let's start with the big story. This just in, the big story. Our first big story is about how piracy is helping Netflix. See, <laughs> look at that. I'm on a task. That I made right. sure to pick an opening video that was right in line with what we're doing here. Is this going to be no, a this, theme that's going to go right the whole way through? Yeah, well, it's usually... Actually, when you're talking about online video, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Netflix launching in the Netherlands, available for €7.99 a month. That is news in and of itself. Uh, but in an interview given to a Netherlands website called Tweaker, the vice president of content acquisition for Netflix, Kelly Merriman, says, 
hey, yeah, we look at the popularity of shows on file sharing platforms to figure out what to acquire. Because if people are finding it there, we figure out, you know what, we're a lot easier and safer way to watch stuff. So Prison Break, for instance, is exactly one of the shows that they're like, it was really popular on local Netherlands file sharing sites. So we decided to acquire it. Now it's part of the Netflix offering in the Netherlands. Okay, now I for see that why this is... Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So I see why this is a newsworthy item, right? You know, Netflix goes to torrent sites to figure out, you know, what to do. But keep in mind, the popularity of torrent sites is an indicator of a cre of, of of an often artificial black market where something's not available any other way. For example, we, Game of Thrones. You know, HBO wants you to be in their ecosystem, but it's so expensive because you have to get cable, you have to get HBO, you have to you know, and then sign up for HBO Go in order to access it. It creates this artificial black market. So, so the mere fact that some, many times what's popular on torrent sites by its very nature means that there's no legal way to get it, no convenient digital video only way to, to, to get it. So it, it makes sense that they would use this as a guidepost, number one, to see what needs are not being met in the digital space, but two, and you know, to a lesser extent, to gauge the popularity of a particular uh, property. So there. Yeah, uh, Merriman, by the way, said exactly similar sorts of things, which is, you know, you we, sometimes, uh, I'm trying to find the exact quote, certainly there's some torrenting that goes on, and that's true around the world, uh, but some of that just creates the demand. So, you know, we look at that as, as a helpful thing. And in fact, Reed Hastings is quoted here saying, Netflix is so much easier than torrenting. You don't have to deal with files. You don't have to download them and move them around. You just click and watch. This is what got me was this idea of a company coming in and saying like, yeah, yeah, all right, torrenting should be illegal. Most of the cases that are, you know, private piracy related. But uh, frankly, we're better than them. And so we're just going to outcompete them. So you wouldn't want to use a torrent. Do you think that, well, Fraser, do you think that works? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think for a lot of people, when they finally get Netflix and they finally have access to shows and they just turn it on on multiple screens and the show is there and and there's enough of a selection that they'll just watch it i mean like with me my philosophy around this house is is i don't really worry about what is or isn't on netflix if i feel like i want to be entertained i go to netflix and there's going to be something that i'm going to want to watch and so if things show up later on then then that's great and i think that that people underestimate just how much that convenience is worth. And you look at all the hoops that people are jumping through. I mean, the most conven convenient experience is BitTorrent. Like, it's just, it's the fastest way to get your media. Not that I do it, but it's the fastest way to get your media and the most convenient way. And so if they can make yeah. these things more convenient, then then the floodgates will open. And like, when are they going to figure this out? Well, yeah, and that I, was, I, uh, disagree. I think Netflix is more convenient when the show is available. I think I think what you're saying, Fraser, is totally true when the show, as Brian pointed out earlier, isn't available anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. that's all I'm saying. Right. So if it's if it's on Netflix, it's the most convenient way. It's fast, it's safe. You're not gonna accidentally download the wrong video, whatever. You're not gonna get tracked and go to jail. But you know, but if what you want is selection, then you go to BitTorrent because that's where everything is. And as soon as they figure this out and put it all in one place, then this pirate piracy problem will just go away. There was a uh, on this show. Many people have heard me uh, use the quote uh, "convenience trumps fidelity." And the first place I ever heard that was from some guy back in the late '90s when MP3s was the big discussion. And he said that uh, convenience trumps fidelity. And he followed it up with, "When we reach a world where it's more convenient to stream all of your audio, uh, audio piracy will will cease to be." Uh, the problem that it is today. And he was pretty much right because nowadays uh, at that time, everybody collected, they hoarded as many music files as they could. They bragged about the size of their collection and then boom, Spotify comes along and all of a sudden the very idea of keeping a collection and even having your own music just seems antiquated and silly. And I suspect that we're starting to see uh, essentially the beginnings of that with Netflix where they're they're saying, hey man, why, why are you downloading files to manage them on your heart? That's dumb. Why don't you just use Netflix? And the answer is we would use Netflix for everything as soon as you guys could just get all the licenses. Or we could use like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Hulu as the three services we know that one of the three is going to have what we're looking for. But right, right, that's now, the uh, that's the monopoly board discussion that you and I have had, right. where it's like I yeah, just want yeah. them to hurry up and carve up the pie so that we know it's available between one of you three bastards. We've got uh, that's also madness, though. Just well, you know, just going through that process, right? Madness. It's with the crazy making that you have to sign up for all these different services and then, <clears throat> you know, 
you, you look for a show and you're not sure whether it's going to be on Amazon or it's going to be on Hulu or whether it's going to be on uh, Netflix. Not, not that it matters. I'm Canadian, so we don't have any choices. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have just, Hulu. Yeah. We don't have Amazon Prime. We just have a mediocre version of Netflix. See, it's so much better because you know you'd look at the one place. It's you get there, what you get. Yeah. It's either that or on CBC. That's it. That's what we get. I, I think if it's a minimal number of services that overlap, I think that's fine. I, I and there's so we'll get to the, some scan lines later on that talk about people trying to help you make sense of the different places that you can go to get your stuff. But we're we're in the early days still of all of that stuff. Agreed. So let's talk about another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Three stories here from The Verge, Variety, and Paid Content. I want to weave together into one discussion topic here. Uh, Breaking Bad rose 50% in viewership in the fourth season. And AMC CEO Josh Sapan, speaking at a conference, attributed some of that to SVOD. He was at the next TV summit. That's where another one of these stories comes from as well. He said, you know what? If, if people hadn't been able to catch up, we, we might have ended up like Firefly, but that stuff doesn't happen anymore because you can have a mediocre first season and know that the word of mouth will build your, your audience as your seasons progress. On the other side, Cartoon Network saw a ratings drop because they added their shows to Netflix in the U.S. They said it was 3% drop. We were prepared for that because we're making up the money that we're losing from that on the deal with Netflix. But this story from Variety claims that you know, they might be losing more than 3% of their audience due to the content available on Netflix. And then Epix, a movie channel, CEO Mark Greenberg at the Next TV Summit said, quote, some in the media business call this cord cutting. But three decades ago, we had a different name for this in the industry. We called it competition, referring to DirecTV and Dish coming into the business and shaking things up. So... Here it is, man. The table is set. And we have networks like AMC saying, actually, making programs is awesome now because of Netflix. And you have people like Cartoon Network saying, well, it might not be awesome for viewership, but I guess we're making enough money off of it. And you got people like Epic saying, this has always been the way. There's always been some new person come in and disrupt the model. So, uh, if, but, but before we turn things over to Frazier, uh, let, let me just chime in and say that it seems to me like we are seeing yet another piece of the fragmentation story that we've told over and over and over again. The big difference between these is that Breaking Bad is a single hour appointment viewing that is um, the only way you get an audience to tune in at a specific time for a specific set of the content is if they're emotionally invested in the story and they have to know what happens next. That works great for Mad Men. It works great for Breaking Bad. It works great for Sons of Anarchy. It works great for uh, Dexter and so on and so on. Um, on the flip side, when it comes to children's programming, kids tend to like to watch lots of repeats and Cartoon Network is essentially uh, this, this pipe that just nonstop does its brand of kids programming and you know that when you turn it on whatever they're going to get you're you you know you you know the spectrum of uh, you know from fart jokes to to cartoon violence that you're going to get and you're comfortable with it and it just keeps feeding them uh by switching to netflix that's a very different thing netflix uh does a very good service to breaking bad type stories and that it brings everyone else up to speed it expands the pie by take by you know you're at the height of this story and everyone else is excited about it and where there was it used to be there was there was it was very difficult to get caught up in the story very expensive now all of a sudden it's cheap and free and now you get caught up with everyone else with the binge viewing experience uh the flip side it, you know in that case obviously Netflix is a positive the flip side is Netflix can be a negative I understand why Cartoon Network could get a dip in ratings because uh when we had cable uh what three months ago uh, that was what I would do. I would turn it on and I knew that the kids were watching the right kind of uh, com content that I was comfortable with. Now they're in the Netflix ecosystem and once they're in there, they never come out. They just keep finding new stories and new shows and and uh, like they, they watch some movie that was made in Russia to celebrate the Russian haze day of cosmonauts with, uh, with, with dogs, animated dogs or whatever. But it's like they don't care because they have no quality filter. And instead, that becomes a branded experience. And weirdly, the Cartoon Network programming is what's attracting them into that bubble. So I could see how that would be a downside for them. 
Now, did you guys have the experience, and I don't know whether this was just like an experiment they were running in Canada, but before the Avengers movie came out, they made all of the prequels to the Avengers movie available on Netflix. And so you could watch Thor and you could watch, uh, you know, Captain America and all these movies leading up to watching Some the of Avengers. Them, I, I, yeah, I, I, it certainly wasn't a promotion here. that I heard about. Yeah. No, it, it, so it, it felt it, like someone was testing this out, right? Uh, that, well, like, that's let's awesome. Get you on I wish board. they would do that more. Yeah. And so there's that. And I totally agree with you about about the kids programs. You know, my kids will just wear out the hard drive, wherever hard drive contains Futurama on the, uh, you know, on the Netflix servers. My kids have, have ground it down to a nub. So uh, so that's definitely the case that that I think if there's a new season of Adventure Time, the kids, they're fine to just watch the first season again and again and again. Uh, but the other thing that's really strange, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, like, are your kids into H2O, this mermaid show? Do you even no. get that in the States, Netflix? I'm a little bit terrified it, to introduce my kids. I haven't gotten my Aust kids started on the H2O. It sounds dangerous. It's an Australian, Can they freebase it? Yes, it's an Australian uh, mermaids sitcom. <laughs> and it, and it's and I think Netflix actually made a sequel to it directly called Mako Mermaids. But the kids here are all over sure. this. They all watch it and they all love it and they talk to each other about this show. They 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 binge watch it. And so there is this opportunity I think where you have these shows. They find these undiscovered shows, bring them out, and then go and get new ver new episodes made. So there's there's too much information here for them to learn and understand, and and it goes both ways. I just so want to point out the historical perspective here, by the way. In 2000, when I worked at Tech TV, we were not allowed to put more than 10 minutes of our video on the website because the cable companies felt that that would undermine the viewership <laughs> if we had the postage stamp reel video playing on the website. Fast forward to Hulu getting launched because we're going to crush YouTube and stop them from stealing our viewers and we're going to control how people watch video online and all the doubts about Netflix and can they afford to continue this model. And now here we are sitting looking at people saying, hey, stuff like Netflix drove our ratings up. Hey, stuff like Netflix didn't drive our ratings up. It drove them down, but we don't care. We're getting money for this. Like the entire world has changed in the past two years. Well, and, and at an astonishing rate, too. I mean, let's face it, you know, it, it, let's we're all comfortable with the fact that this is a very slow revolution that we're looking forward to here. Uh, but the mere fact that it's happened as fast as it has in relative terms is utterly remarkable to me. Let us start another revolution, Brian Brushwood, a revolution of well-designed websites. Thanks oh, to our dude. sponsor of today's show, Squarespace.com. Okay, now you've taught, you've taught, you and I have talked about this. We sat on your back porch having a beer, and you're saying, Brian, I want to set the web on fire. I got an I amazing idea chair. Yeah. for an entire platform that would make it fast, easy, and reliable. He said, and you, you, you said, Brian, the future is distributed network hosting. That way you can't get taken down by Reddit success or Dig's success. This was success 1937, or, by the way. That's, yes, these were all things that you said. And then, and then I had to break your heart when I was like, well, I'm pretty sure that's all going to happen with Squarespace. Squarespace is going to do all that. Plus, they're going to make it look awesome because they have these amazing templates that even if you're not good, if you don't know your HTs, Ms, or Ls, let's say you don't even know what CSS stands for, that's fine. They take care of all that stuff. They make you look badass. And your website's reliable and strong. And best of all, you know, they do commerce now, Tom. That was the one thing you said. I brought you up mean, Squarespace and you're like, they'll never do commerce, though. And they'll never like, keep okay, the wheels so. of industry turning. That's right. Well, you're wrong. They do. In fact, in fact, I had them send you some copy on, on their, their commerce stuff. What? Oh, you? Oh, hold on. I've just got the, this is just in. This note <laughs> has just come across. That's how my fast list. they are. I just said this, and now it's already in your inbox. That's amazing. They actually have a way for you to sell things on your site. It's physical or digital. Am I reading this right, Brian? You can you sell sure are. In your in your store, hosting is included. Hey, you know what? I want to see proof. I want to see proof that people are using this. I think. You should send a tweet with a link to your Squarespace website to no, hashtag Twit Squarespace to prove. There's a the reason we always called you Doubting Thomas. Thomas, Thomas, you shouldn't be such a doubter. But you know what? Oh. You could go try it out for yourself. You don't need a credit card or nothing. Just head on over to Squarespace.com, sign up for a free two-week trial. You can see with your own eyes. See with your eyes. Feel with your hands on the keyboard as you type in your email address because that's all they ask for. And then use Frame Rate Nine. That's the offer code. To get 20% off and show your support for frame rate, 
You know what we do? You know what I do? As doubting Thomas as I may be sometimes, I thank Squarespace every day for their support of frame rate. Squarespace. I do everything too. You I do. In fact, here's me. Thank you, Squarespace. I truly appreciate what you've done for us. Hallowed <laughs> be your websites. Ah, uh, look at that. Look at that supplication. Let's uh, let's slip on into the slipstream. What is Maker Studio up to? Okay, these guys dominate YouTube. Just, like every other video I watch on YouTube is one of the Maker Studios videos. They raised $26 million from a group of investors, including Canal Plus, Malaysia's Astro Holding Company, and Singtel Group. This is after they got $36 million out of Time Warner and after they bought Blip TV, a competitor to YouTube. Are they, are they just trying to win internet video? Is that, that what's going on here? Man, I, if they are, they're doing it like in a really stealthy kind of way. Uh, let, let me let me check with you because I, to be honest, the only reason I know the maker name is because they keep showing up in our stories here on Frame Rate. Fraser, are you familiar with Maker <laughs> you're Studios? Like, I've never seen a video. I don't know what you're talking no, about. No, I well, it's sort of in the same way, which is that you hear that they're dominating YouTube, but I actually don't run into as many of their videos as as you might. But I, I've experienced. I, I think I can understand why they're making this move for sure. Well, who who are like? I guess they're. I think their number one property is uh, what uh, is it? PewDiePie. I I don't even know how to say the dude's PewDiePie. name. But uh, yeah, there you go. That guy. PewDiePie. I'm sitting here trying to make it into a into a My Little Pony reference. Uh, but yeah. the. Uh, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that you get well when you put release videos on YouTube. The networks come out of the woodwork and they find you and they send you these emails. Say, would you like to join our network and and we can help you with advertising and we can help you with production and and so on. And uh, you know, I haven't, I personally haven't worked with any of these of these networks, but you can really see that if as you get deeper into the YouTube ecosystem, you you're really dependent on YouTube as as sort of your connection to your audience. And so yes. I can see why for for folks like Maker and, and and other networks and other individual YouTube creators, they need to go around YouTube to make that direct connection to to their audience. And yeah, and you know, keep it just in mind sense. also part of the reason and, and I, I assume you deal with this firsthand since you you are an independent content creator and so you get all these these solicitations essentially what all of these networks are offering is they're all selling the fantasy that every artist wants every artist whether they're on stage on a record label whether they're uh, on on television whether they're syndicated whether on YouTube every artist wants to believe that it's possible that their part of the operation can just be to make their thing. And then like, uh, and, and not have to own or understand the sponsorship or do any of the sales or any of that stuff. And that's what these guys essentially sell. And, and, and I'm, I'm calling it a fantasy because there's always some kind of harsh reality that, you know, there's a trade off when you get somebody else to handle, you know, whether it's your finances, your advertising or whatever. Uh, and, and Maker has, a, as and keep in mind, this is somebody who has not delved deeply into it, but has a, a mixed reputation uh, when it when it comes to 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 providing that service where it's like, oh, you yeah, know, there's lots, some content of, providers who are of, happy. Lots of content providers have taken Maker to issue. And I think that's a signal of how big they are is that, yes. you know, I'm not excusing it, but I'm saying you only get those kinds of disputes when there's enough money at stake to make them worthwhile. And and just to answer Brian's question, I was trying to find a good list of the stuff on Maker because I didn't want to get it wrong. Epic Rap Battles of History, Kevin oh, wow. Smith. Robert De Niro's Tribeca Enterprises, PewDiePie, as you, you correctly mentioned, uh, the list goes on. They have a ton of people you don't even realize probably that you're watching that are part of the Maker Studios. Well, and, but and that's, I know that's, they did. Oh, they did oh, quite ahead, a lot Frazier. of. Uh, oh yeah, they did a lot of fairly onerous uh, sort of legalities and the, the way they structure their contracts with the creators. Things yeah. like we own the copyright for everything you do in perpetuity, and and so I think they. I, pretty I think owners, they, but pretty they, standard by histories. You recommend well, exactly. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that what troubles me about the way a lot of these studios are working is that it's almost like they're taking the playbook from the previous generation. They're looking and saying, you know, if if I was a record label for the YouTube era, if I was a movie studio for the YouTube era, let me just dust off this contract and bring it forward. But the reality now is that that we as content creators can move from place to place, that the best game is always to build our own distribution channel that we control and that they want to come and provide services to us as as creators. And I think that that that's I don't think that lesson has really gotten learned yet, and I think that's what you're saying. You know, it seems like it's a dream come true, but the reality is that it's a long, hard road to build up a sizable distribution channel on your own.
Yeah. I, I think I think you're 100 percent right. The uh, the only thing as far as the um, uh, maker specifically goes is uh, in this discussion, I don't I, th I think it's a fantasy to decide that we're not going to go through the same growing pains as every other media distribution has before us. But what pleases me is how fast we're going through them. You know, only five within five years, we saw the onerous contracts go, go out and now we're seeing the backlash against them and we're seeing uh, content creators being empowered, which is good news. And then real quickly, this isn't big news, but kind of need to note it. Hulu offering fall premieres from Fox, ABC, and NBC online. Of course, Fox, ABC, and NBC are the three owners. NBC a silent one since Comcast bought NBC. But Fox, ABC, and NBC, if you want to watch season premieres of shows, you can go to Hulu and do that. This has become standard every year now. Uh, but Man, the new how stuff great. Is how great yeah. that this news headline is is a non-item now. It's you almost know, The nothing. fact that we yeah, can right. say this, we're like, well, duh. Like that's that's great. That's another step in yeah, the right direction. Again, another perspective. It used to be like, whoa, Hulu's putting on premieres of season opening shows before they air on TV. This is great. Now it's just like, oh yeah, it's that time again. <laughs> Fall. So <laughs> of course they are. And and what they're available exactly on iTunes this? for downloads and stuff too. Yeah. yeah. What is this Hulu that you speak of? <laughs> Wait a minute, is this a Canadian thing? Do you guys not have the Hulus? If only we had Pro XPN as a sponsor today, no. I could I was tip just you off on how to watch. <laughs> I, now but I have been known to travel so. to multiple countries and multiple continents over the course of an hour, so it's possible <laughs> that I understand what you're yeah. talking about. But, you know, but I mean, no, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I can't even tell you how frustrating it is to be like, hey, check out this video. It's on MTV. And you're like, oh, I'm nope. sorry, you filthy Canadian. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I, love, I love the fact that you even back said back sorry north. to just drive home the Canadianness of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> sorry. All right. Let's, Can I let's borrow your it. crayons? I'll give them back tomorrow. Let's move into some tube tops. So uh, Roku is going to add a Chromecast-like or perhaps AirPlay-like feature, depending on how you look at it, to apps. It's working at, with an API, and they announced this at the next TV summit, to allow app builders to include a sling to Roku function. Of course, you have to have an app on the Roku, but somebody like Netflix, who does have an app on the Roku, could then include a button that says, hey, I want to watch this on my Roku and control your Roku with your app the way you control Chromecast with the app. So help me out on this, Tom. Uh, sure, Brian. What can the, I do? The big, the big difference between the Chromecast uh, method and the, you know, the, the the AirPlay method. AirPlay, you actually get the video onto your phone, and then it AirPlay takes the that least, content straight from your phone. Yeah, uh, AirPlay is is mirroring. You're saying take what's on my screen and send it to the Apple TV. That's not how Chromecast works. That's not how Roku's working. Right. So so the way Chromecast works and the way Roku works is all of a sudden it's like okay, well we need you guys to be to, to write and rewrite all these apps so that they're compatible with this device and that device and and set up the standard. Not so exactly. essentially what, what Roku no what Roku is saying, because this is important, is if you have an app on our platform on the Roku already, we're gonna give you a little code you can add to your mobile app to allow you to send whatever that mobile app is playing to your app that's already on Roku. So it's not that onerous. Okay, but, but but it's not really sending from the phone. What it's doing is that the phone says, hey, bro, I'm watching this file, sends a link. And he's like, oh, sending, well, I'll watch it too. The, and the then, link, yeah. Right, Yeah. exactly. That's what Chromecast uh, is. It, it seems like both of those are more complicated than just AirPlay. It seems like, it's and, actually and I don't know why. It's much less complicated because all I have to do is say, here's the resource location. Send that little string of text over to the app on the Roku, and the Roku app says, oh, yeah, the resource location, I'll grab that and start downloading it. What Apple TV is doing is saying, I want to take every bit that is being shown on this screen right now and fling it across your Wi-Fi network, reconstitute it, and put it up on your television. Poorly. Yeah, but it seems like you can get away with, with true mirroring, then, then all of a sudden you're unrestricted, and, and there's no... I, I, maybe I don't know enough about if there's been any... Do you, have you used a Chromecast? I mean, I'm not I, sure I'm why not. you're raising I'm this not. complication. No, 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 what's no, no, no. I, 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 I just, this is me purely just trying to wrap my mind around the difference between the two. Because you're, look, the difference between only the one two of us is the is, host of Tech News Today, is what I'm trying to say. The difference between the two is, well, I'm trying to understand why you're asking. Because to me, it doesn't matter, right? The difference between what? the two is with the Apple TV, I can now say, well, whatever's on my screen is going to be over there for good okay. or for ill. Here, and once why it I'm sending the NFL network from my iPad to the Apple TV. I can't use my iPad for anything else anymore because it's going to mirror. With Chromecast and okay. Roku, I can say, hey, send this copy of Always Sunny from my iPhone to the device over there. Now I can keep using my iPhone for other stuff and it's just going to keep playing because it's not actually dependent on the screen. 
that is the first compelling argument that I've heard for the one over the other. And I thank you for that. Uh, because my problem was mainly, it just seems to me like mirroring is inherently unrestricted because there's, if the right, system can't the know what you're showing, then there's it just two different yeah, ways of correct. doing it. Yeah. Right. Correct. Okay. Well, that's where I'm at. Well, let me ask Frazier. Frazier, have you done either of these? Have you ever used the AirPlay or a Chromecast? I've used AirPlay. And uh, I, I don't, people, when the Chromecast came out, people were like, why, you know, why get it? Just use AirPlay. But AirPlay is just an awful experience for me. Like it's, you know, <laughs> I run it from my MacBook. I've, you know, I run it for, you have to have the device. It, it, then it bogs down the device and you can't use it. And then it, it, you know, has stutters and there's all kinds of problems. So, so Chromecast in theory is exactly what I want to see. I, I, I just want to bark orders at the different televisions in my house. You over there, you're playing YouTube and that one over there, you can play Netflix. And then they just start downloading their, their media. I think that's, that's a perfect setup. And so I think with Roku, I mean, they, you can't run YouTube on the Roku. So it's a little more restrictive in, in certain ways. And they've got to have the app enabled. So I think there needs to be a standard that you can just say every box can play every kind of media in well, some way. Well, that's called way. a computer. And nobody wants to allow that because of the video. This is all of these dances, by the way, are being done because of the restrictions of copyright in the movie and television industry, right? Otherwise, it would just be like, here's a box that does everything because those boxes already exist, but they won't get the deals to have stores and apps and things like Netflix without incorporating DRM. And once you incorporate DRM, you have to agree to do all kinds of things. And YouTube says, well, I don't want you to have an app because you're not going to show the commercials, so you can't do that. And Chromecast has to say like, well, I can do Hulu in a tab, but that's it. I can only mirror a tab now. I can't actually mirror a Hulu app because Hulu hasn't agreed and we get, we get all these dances. The point of this tiny little story instead of becoming this big story, was to be that, hey, Roku can now do what Chromecast and Apple does. Because there are yeah. some conditions, especially in the upcoming OS X Mavericks, where AirPlay can allow you to sling something over to your television and you still be able to use your computer. Uh, and there are certain apps that can be coded that way. This is well beyond the scope of what I intended. Yes, and, and I apologize. Like, blame hey, me, blame look, me look in my Roku's ignorance. No, it's, no it's but just, I think you're getting just, at the heart of it, though. Right. Which is like, I don't know if you guys have had this situation, but I've enraged my family with my crazy, janky computer setups where I'm just trying to get media from a computer onto a television. You want to watch the stuff on the television and you don't want to and it, you want it to be simple and you want it to be fast, but you want it to be flexible. And and the Chromecast, by by allowing you giving every device a remote control to all the televisions in your house, that makes a lot of sense. But. You know, if it doesn't work for if it works for, you know, Netflix, but it doesn't work for HBO Go, then now it all breaks apart again. So yeah, and that's that's the, what the entire history of the show has been about, which is covering that <laughs> battle. Like that is that is what this is a battle going on to In stop fact, the original you from title, doing the simple thing. Yeah, the original is, title we had was Brian and the Tom. Future. Yeah, Brian and Tom get annoyed was the original title uh, for this show. <laughs> Exactly. But, but it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I, and, and blame everything on me for slowing everything down. I'm glad I got that uh, again. Like, it's the first time that I've heard it so clearly put that way. Thank you very much, Tom, for that. Sure. Yeah, no. Uh, time, th this next story ties right into this conversation. Time Warner Cable saying by next year, if you're a Time Warner Cable company, they're going to let you use their app to get your cable television without having to get a set-top box. So if you have an Xbox 360 and you have Time Warner Internet as well, that's the other key, uh, you can then just have that be your set-top box. Or if you have the Time Warner app on Roku, or you just want to use the Time Warner app on your iPad, that's fine. They don't care. They're, this is the first cable company to officially say, we won't require you to pretend to buy a set-top box at all. We'll just let right. you use apps. And for the record, uh, in my experience, and I haven't touched any of the other ones out there or not enough of them out there, but but oh my God, is Time Warner's DVR interface unbelievably bad it makes sense like if somebody's gonna cry screw it let's whatever just start from scratch make your own thing they're a good candidate to do it and who knows i don't know once this comes out maybe i'll actually sign up for a little like three-month trial or whatever I'll, i may dip a little toe back in the time warner waters around gotcha. the time that game of thrones time. comes out <laughs> the time warner piranhas will get you <laughs> probably let's check out film film shall we i think we should What? 
Dead, a new Walking Dead spinoff coming to AMC in the amazing year that is going to be 2015 with the next Avengers movie and Star Wars and all kinds of crazy stuff coming. Apparently, this will be set in a different area of the world so that Robert Kirkman can just go off and create new characters, new situations that aren't dependent on the comic book at all. I can't decide how much of my annoyance with uh, The Walking Dead was with it diverging from the, com the, the comics. And it's like there are times... I, I know it can't be all of it because there are times that I love Game of Thrones specifically for the things that it does different for the books. Um, but, but you know, eventually I gave up because the characters just made no sense and everyone was made of rubber. Uh, the uh, uh, I, I, I think I love this idea because it's a good universe. It's a good idea. I want to see new stories and it would be great to dive in maybe with some different writers that I wouldn't get annoyed with. But I'm also kind of on guard. I don't know. Do you watch The Walking Dead, Frazier? Of course. Uh, yeah, and I'm with you, actually, uh, in not being such a big fan of The Walking Dead anymore. And I feel terrible because <laughs> I really should. But I watch it and and every now and then the episodes are great. And every now and then the episodes, you just kind of tough through it and, and feel frustrated. Uh, did you I read the comic book? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. And so and it was terrific and yeah. horrible. And the awful things that happened have have, you know, and I guess. When you see The Walking Dead in this latest season where they kind of – they went there. And you're like, oh, are they going to go – yeah, they went there. And then are they going to go there? No, they're not going to go there. And so that's the thing. You want them to go there. I would love to see a, a better handling of World War – I'll say this, World War Z. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, mm. uh, you know, you, oh, very have nice. you guys Thank read – yeah, have you guys you read World Z. War Z? It was all right. Yeah. All right. World yeah, War Z. I, have you guys yeah, read, read that? I read it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I would love to see that world. You know, and not the movie, yeah. but the but the book, the you know the the uh, the Brooks movie, yeah, the Brooks book. Um, I would love to see that. So you know, bringing more of the stuff in the same world is it going to take away his focus from the actual Walking Dead show? That's a bad thing. I yeah. I think this is a good thing, and here's why: most of us who have read the comic book, and that's why I asked you, Fraser have been a little disappointed with the Walking Dead TV show. Folks I know, like my wife, who didn't read the comic book, like it better. They still have their issues with it, but they like it better than us. And I think what Kirkman is doing here is saying, you know what's happening is I've written the comic book. And when I'm working on the TV show, I want to come up with new stuff. I've got new ideas, new situations, things that have occurred to me since I wrote the comic book that I want to try out. And you people seem to get really upset when I do that. So what if I just go and start in a different corner of the universe altogether where you don't have preconceived notions about what the characters are doing, but I can still deliver that same world and that same heart-ripping drama that I did in yes. the comic book on the television. I, and, and it might be more like the first season of Walking Dead, in which case I'm all for that. Right. And the, the answer, of course, is yes, we think you should do that. Uh, no, you're confused about why we're no longer watching The Walking Dead. Yeah, do it if it's not going to suck. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> there we go. That's, yes. the, that's exactly the right answer right. here. If it's awesome, uh, if you're going to make it awesome. Disney CFO Jay Rossolo apparently uh, said to some investors that the Star Wars spinoffs, not the one J.J. Abrams is working on, but they, remember they said they're also going to do all these spinoffs. They're going to have one Star Wars a year. Are going to be origin stories, which could add some credence to rumors that they were going to focus on Yoda, Han Solo, Boba Fett. So kind of, I don't know if it's X-Men origins type situation, but definitely like we get to find out how Han Solo became a mercenary, perhaps, let, let, or let, Yo let, Yoda let you, as a young man. Let me give you just two ago. real quick contradictory, contradictory uh, takes on this. Uh, the reason this is a terrible idea is because it, um, it 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 makes the universe smaller. The whole thing that sold us on Star Wars is what a big, expansive universe it was filled with billions of stories. There's always another story around the corner. And instead, every move to say like, well, this is the successful character, so let's just keep cashing in on Darth Vader's image or whatever. That's the reason they shouldn't do this. However, on the flip side, Part of the reason that I'm such a wounded animal when it comes to the Star Wars story is that I deeply, deeply loved the Star Wars literary expanded universe uh, series of books where they would have somebody, somebody like a Moma de Don, who, who was sold as a toy called a hammerhead, is shows up for like three seconds in the cantina. But instead, you got these 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 ace science fiction writers coming up with this giant backstory with who he is and where he's going and so on. And they were beautiful. And that's part of why I was so mad when George Lucas just cast all that aside and said, none of that's canon. Only the movies are canon. Like, um, on the one hand, I'm sad to see us go back and feeding at the same well again. But 
On the other hand, if I can get just a taste of that expanded universe experience again in movie form, I would be thrilled. Yeah, I, uh, oh man, I'm going to get a lot of hate on this one. Uh, so I've come out the other side from you, Brian, and I now am kind of done with Star Wars. And, and it's, <laughs> you know, and it's, I know, I know. And I, you know, I love, I love the show. It's a, you know, one of the most meaningful television watching or movie watching experiences in my whole childhood. But, but I think that, and then I was excited to watch all the movies and then you, the reboots and they weren't that good and there's Clone Wars are okay and I played all the video games. So I've been there. I loved the X-Wing video game. But um, I feel like when you get these reboots, when they keep going back and trying to cash in, it sucks the oxygen out of new ideas. And think about worlds like Firefly or Elysium or just all these other amazing ideas that come out of nowhere and 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 then you suddenly you want to live in this world now and and i always find that when they come back and they like let's examine this further part of this universe that may or may not do a good job of it it you know sometimes it works and great you told a good story sometimes it doesn't work and then it's just like oh you made the whole thing a little worse when there could have there's a million people out there with fantastic brand new ideas that just don't get they don't get any exposure. They don't get any love because there's all this focus on Star Wars. How can we make more toys and sell them in Happy Meals? So I yeah, sound so jaded. I, I'll, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't blame you. I think you're 100% right. Uh, but if anyone can pull this off, remember, Disney made possible the Avengers. Disney made possible the Avengers. It was it was like a four-year arc to get us there. But man, was it worth it. Think about all the movies that, that, that had to lead up just to make the Avengers happen. I trust Disney. And I can't believe I'm saying these words out of my stupid filthy face, but I trust Disney to make things right and make Star Wars relevant again. But think about all the stories that are put in front of them that they're having to turn away because they're going to go and talk about Jar Jar Binks' backstory. Uh, no, they won't. They won't. Look, look, I, again, if this was LucasArts last year, then yeah, they probably would. But they won't. I trust Disney. Disney's going to say, great, you want a Jar Jar Binks movie? We'll put him in for three minutes. We'll have the title be about him. But really, this guy is going to be the star of this show with a brand new backstory that we're really excited to sell. These guys know what they're doing, Frazier. I think they can salvage our childhood. It's not too late, Disney. That's why I, they you know call what? him Doubting Frazier. I'm just saying. I tried, I tried to get my kids <laughs> into this, and they they don't like it. Well, like they don't if, like if you showed Wars. them the pre, if you showed them the prequels, I, all of it. Then, I yeah, tried, yeah. You know, and I tried in the most, in the best way I could, and they just. They, so maybe that's the problem: is that I was trying to don't restart take my this childhood away from with me, my kids. Frazier, I know. I swear, I know. if you I'll, leave me a broken man, I will never forgive you. How old are your kids? Uh, nine, five, and newborn. There you go. So the nine, if the nine-year-old isn't a super Star Wars freak right now, you've lost your chance. No, no, no. Well, she she likes. She's never seen any of the prequels, and she will never see any of the prequels. <laughs> she's only seen the original. And in fact, I show her the despecialized editions of it, which is, which is I think why she likes them. All right, I know we're running behind here, Tom. Special. Yeah. Let's move on to the scan lines. Dan Noble. Luters sent that to us. That is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan Luters. Uh, let's start off with, you got, we got the 60 seconds. Okay, here we go. Luma for iPad. This is one of the things I, I alluded to earlier. It's an iPad app that attempts to be a TV guide for the internet. So Netflix, Hulu, Vudu, all of that stuff. And learn your taste. So it's not telling you like, okay, put in a search of what you want to watch. We'll tell you where you can watch it. It's telling you like, hey, you want to watch something? You're not sure what? Answer some questions. We'll get a sense of your taste. And then we'll start telling you, here are great things you can watch. And you can even pick what services you want it to index. All right, let me let me pose the question to Frazier since we have 30 seconds here. Frazier, uh, what uh, essentially it sounds to me like they're trying to out Netflix, Netflix's search algorithms. Can they do it? And do you believe in it? Uh, whoa, uh, yes, they could probably come up with an algorithm that would do a good job. Although Netflix spent a lot of money and a lot of time to figure out a really good recommendation engine. So if it's better, it'll be hard to make it better than that. It's made so of you people it? too, by the way. They crowdsource part of this. Oh, that's Now smart. with more people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, Guidebox gives developers a free API to integrate unified search for Netflix, Hulu, iTunes, and more. This is another thing we've been talking about on Frame Rate, how we just want a simple way to search everything at once and find what we want. Uh, and uh, we got a bunch of these out there. Uh, what's different about Guidebox, Tom? 
Uh, nothing, as far as I can tell, <laughs> other than the fact that it has an API in it. Uh, I don't know. It's a neat integration. Uh, I guess the, the API for the developers. So GetGlue has already included it. And unlike FanHat and Fan.TV, it's not trying to be the service. It's trying to be the service for everybody. Like, we'll provide it yep. for everybody. Let me let me ask Fraser real quick. What do you do use I get if you to, want to, to find out what something's available? I want to use an extension. Do I get to use my extension? Yes, use well, your you extension. Seconds. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, I will. Okay, so I think that when you see services like this, it is people attempting to bring all of these services under one service. And so, you know, this is the, the network is attempting to show, the demand is attempting to show that what we really want is one place where we go where everything is available and we watch it. And so you're going to see these things pop out of the sides, the seams of the streaming services. And this is just another example of it. You know? It sounds to me like like you're not saying that this is the one, but you're saying there is going to be one, and it's going to come up just like this. We're out of nowhere, off to the side. It's going to have a, a an interface that's easy to use. It's going to have intuitive uh, ability to search for your stuff. It's going to get your taste better than someone else, and then all of a sudden it'll just become the, the Napster of, of finding your online videos. Yeah, and until there is one place to find what you want to watch, when I forget how you say this, when you want, however you want, on whatever screen you yeah. want – then, then these services are going to attempt to keep trying to sort of solve these gaps. Yeah, like it's going to be a box that solves the interface. Netflix is arriving on Virgin Media's pay TV platform in the UK this year. You may say, well, why do I care about that? It's Netflix arriving on an official cable company's box. This isn't just a TiVo box, which has had Netflix for a long time. This is Virgin Media's cable service saying the box that we give you that has the TiVo service on it will have Netflix. So that is potentially 1.7 million UK homes that Netflix just gets put in as an option when you're watching your cable TV. But also, more importantly, I feel like the, the real story here is that is that they didn't decide to build their own brand. I'm using air quotes. You know, they didn't decide to keep it in-house. They didn't try to say, oh, well, we, you know, we're a virgin and we need to, to build our virgin brand for online delivery of video. The fact that, they, that they're like, no, everyone loves Netflix. Go with Netflix. That is what's huge to me. I think they still the have the same thing I just said. Stuff. So it's like a, the yes. mergification continues. I like it. I like your style. Plus, uh, trademark mergification. Please get on that right away. Yeah. Uh, hey, Tom, you still watching Under the Domes? Yeah, you watching actually, the Domes? I, I caught up. We'll talk it, about it more it while get, we're watching. Does, does it get better? Can you, you know what's insidious about that show? I want to say, I wanna, well, I'll just say it now. Under the Dome is just good enough to keep you watching, but not good enough for you to like. Ah, that's a bummer. Ouch. Okay, well, the good news is, is you'll continue to be able to watch it four days later on uh, Amazon Instant Prime uh, streaming. They, they renewed their deal. They announced Thursday that they've renewed their deal for the show's second season, which will air in summer 2014. Uh, of course, you've heard us talk about Under the Dome. You don't need us to explain it to you. What about you, Frazier? Are you watching Under the Dome? I am not. Don't. I won't. <laughs> just keep watching yeah, and you'll yeah, regret okay. it. This is where the, the worm eats its own tail, but you hearing you guys complain about it made me <laughs> not watch it. It sounds to me, it sounds to me like Under the Dome is the, the ramen noodles of uh of, of narrative fiction. Right. Where yeah. it's like it's, uh, the, it's got MSG. You don't you don't want to do that. <laughs> you'll feel full, but you won't be. All right. Uh, this is not John McCain's law. Another member of Congress, this time on the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, Representative Anna Eshoo of California, has proposed a law to block the ability of networks to block their networks. So in other words, it would give consumers the power to drop broadcast networks from their TV packages and forbid broadcasters from forcing cable and satellite companies to buy extra channels when they license broadcast stations. It also would outlaw retaliatory measures like when CBS blocked Time Warner internet users from accessing CBS.com. Man, I haven't really thought this all the way through, but but you know me, I'm one of those, those idiot libertarian knee-jerk guys who it's like, to me... The, the answer is very rarely for the government to get involved unless it's to remove existing laws. That's part of why I love the Aereo case is because it's a breakdown of of, of existing structures. I, I don't know. What, what's your gut tell you on this one, Tom? It tells me this will never pass because of the moneyed interest fighting against it. So rich people will <laughs> stop this from being a problem for you, Brian. Don't worry. All right. Let me ask Frazier this one. Frazier, you, you got an iPad, right? Uh, I do, yes. And you got kids, right? I do, yeah, two that yeah, use the yeah, iPad. Yeah. 
uh, are, are, are your kids interested in The Little Mermaid? Maybe you're going to go see the re-release of The Little Mermaid coming up soon. Uh, they would absolutely not, but I'll say yes, sure, yeah. Okay, sure. All right, let's pretend they will. Uh, yeah. And uh, and if they do, will you bring your iPad for your kids to watch while they're watching The Little Mermaid? I, I will, and I'll tell you why. Because I've taught my kids an awful lot about technical support. And I can just imagine them walking into that place and helping kids turn off and on their iPads and connect to the the Wi-Fi network and, uh, you know, troubleshoot the kinds of problems that this is going to cause. This is madness. Imagine. <laughs> okay, but... I, I, okay, first of all, you are right. Listen, it is madness, but but it's also a step. It's it's at least acknowledging the way people do things anyway. Make it official that people like to look look at a like second let screen. Let them multitask while they're sitting in the movie theater. Uh, re okay, real quick. Uh, let me do use my extension on this. Uh, I, I do just want to get out there that it's called Second Screen Live. Uh, Disney's created an app that will interact with the 1989 classic. So basically they can play games to entertain themselves while they're not being entertained with, by the <laughs> right. movie. That's all I wanted to say. Like, that's, that's all I'm going to use like, for my extension. It's going to be so <laughs> mediocre that you're going to want to bring in an iPad to entertain your kids through the slow spots. Amazing. Uh, All right. And they get to sing along because the words will show up on the iPad. Because kids <laughs> never can learn lyrics to music. We all know this, yeah. obviously. Oh. Let's move on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was the other one. We got that one from Tony. Thank you for sending that one, Tony. That was almost a oh. toaster like one. I love that. I like it. Uh, all right. Let's uh, talk about what we're watching. watching brian brushwood you've been watching legend of Korra. uh yeah legend of Korra is back and and at first i was like oh where am i gonna get it turns out they streamed the first two episodes at nickelodeon.com and it was a fantastic experience it streamed hd we all gathered into my office to watch it and to be honest the kids were so excited about it that they went back to go watch avatar the last airbender again this will be their fourth lap through the story it's an epic epic story i can't say enough good things about it it is not on netflix but it is on amazon instant prime so we're about uh midway through the first season on that right now uh also i watched uh, dread originally you know dread 3d uh and uh, of course breaking bad and um uh my brother last night got on my junk because I wasn't because I hadn't been watching Bob's Burgers but those are all on Netflix now so while I played a video game called uh, uh King's Bounty uh I uh, I watched like like 12 episodes of break of of, of Bob's Burgers Breaking Burgers great. yeah Breaking Burgers yeah. eating burgers <laughs> uh also Breaking Bad which we'll talk about in a spoiler zone it was okay uh I talked about Under the Dome I was watching um Newsroom this season and they just had their finale it was good it was a better season. It's still, I, I like when they're covering the news better and they did more of that. So that's probably why I like the season better. And also Haven returned, which I think is probably, as I've said many times, one of the most underrated shows on television. It looks like it's going to be even better. They've got the ice truck killer guy from Dexter is playing one of the main character's brothers. And they've got Craig Ferguson from Eureka is playing a, uh, a special character that I don't want to spoil. So looks like it's going to be an excellent season of Haven. I'm really excited that one's back. Frazier, what have you been watching? Uh, so I've also been watching Breaking Bad, so I can join you for the spoiler zone. I have also Woo! been watching Korra, and and it was it was great. And I I like Korra better than I like the original Airbender. And okay, oh, all right. Now, first of all, like like I am I am deeply spiritually in love with Korra. She is an adorable person who is like I'm like oh my god, I want you to be a real person. Uh, yes, so I totally understand where you're coming from, and and uh, I was worried. Knowing that it would be all about well, this is vaguely spoiler zone, I don't know, but uh, but uh, I knew the second season was going to be about the spirit world, and those were yeah. the least interesting Avatar episodes for me. But I loved the direction they're going with it. What did you think? Well, yeah. So I, the the first season was terrific, and I I put it you know side by side with any of the seasons of the Last Airbender, and I think it was better. It was tighter. They really you know they could handle some fairly complicated and adult topics, and yet keep the kids entertained. Uh, it was a terrific piece of story. It's the best anime ever made, which is kind of sad. Um, well, it, uh, no, but it's kind of awesome, dude. It's like every scene was great, and it's so self-referential. I, I mean, I could spoil a bunch yeah. of stuff, but, but it's it's no, so it's, great. If you're not watching it, go back and start at the yeah. beginning. Don't don't start at Korra. Go back and watch Avatar. Show. It is an anybody show. And season right. two, so far, 
uh, felt a little telegraphed so far. So I felt I, I I hope I get swerved hard really quickly because it felt a little I felt a little like I knew where the story was going. So, uh, but so far, you know, it's great to see these characters, all new characters. Like they're like they don't feel like they need to have to keep rehashing the same old characters. You get a guitar reference, and then boom, you're back into all new characters that you don't know how they operate, you don't know who they are, you don't know where they stand. I love it. I love the bravery it's, of the way it's they the tell the story. It's the opposite of what it's it's the opposite of what you were griping about in the Star Wars universe. So okay, it's like they're so doing gonna, exactly what you want. Right. And so here's the thing, right? So this show and I actually emailed you guys on this. It's called Bravest Warriors. Have you seen it yet? No. No, okay. No, you, I saw you your told email, us though. to and I need to. I've I've watched <laughs> yeah. little clips Five and they all look great. Minutes. Five minutes to watch the first episode. So it is, in my opinion, one of the best pieces of science fiction storytelling that I've seen in recent memory. It's by uh, Pendleton Ward, the same guy that does Adventure Time, but it's all on YouTube. And they're just five-minute stories. There's 11 in the first season. There's a couple of shorts. The characters are terrific. Um, and it is like someone has taken science fiction tropes and just boiled them down to their purest essence and it, where where you can then speak about science fiction where entire concepts like uh, holographic creatures becoming real and sentient just as like verbs. You use those like your verbs. It's hard to explain. And it's just an absolutely terrific show. So if you get a chance to watch it, Bravest Warriors, you can go through the whole set, set in an hour and there you will walk away with catchphrases. All right. I'm, All right. I'm, I'm in. Gonna, You've sold yeah. it. I'm going to take the Bravest Warriors challenge. Take Brian the and I yeah. the challenge, and then we'll let me know how it went next uh, next week. I'll be I'll be listening. All right, we'll do. We'll be talking to your ears. Also, uh, I think I guess apparently the chat room says I said Craig Ferguson from Eureka instead of Colin Ferguson. Uh, apologies okay. to both. They're both great, but Craig Ferguson, the tonight the talk show host, did not appear in Haven. Colin Ferguson, the actor from Eureka, appeared in Haven. Let's go on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on. We're going to start with some feedback from Bob. What were you going to say, Brian? I was gonna I was gonna tell you all about Bob's email. He says, oh, yeah, I remember you about. guys ragging on planes when it first came out, mostly because it was terrible and a huge turkey in the movie draft. For anyone who cares about quality entertainment, there's no reason this originally direct-to-video movie should have ended up in theaters, but it appears to have been a great financial move by Disney. Looking at this week's box box office report, I noticed planes has made $83 million domestically and $138 million worldwide. I don't know what direct-to-video sequels tend to make. But it can't be nearly that much. While I feel bad for Tom and anyone else who bought it in the movie draft, as a Disney shareholder, I'm glad to see they know where the money is. Thanks for a great show. Uh, that's from Bob. Um, so here's I, I I put this one up top because I wanted to counter this, which is like, yes, it made much, much more money than a direct-to-video sequel ever should. But the reason it did is because all of the marketing positioned it as some kind of next episode in the cars line. Um, and and Everything has a price. And what they did was they leveraged the Cars brand behind this, this, this bad movie, Planes. And yes, they were able to force an $83 million payday as a result. But that comes at a cost. And, and could it be that doing this ruins their chances to make even more money with the Cars 3 sequel? Cars, of course, is, is the most uh, lucrative merchandising franchise in the entire Disney library. And I think they did harm to the brand by by leveraging it with the with the uh, associated with with the show planes. So while yes, I understand what you're saying in the short term. In the long term, I think it cost them maybe more than that eighty three million dollars merited. We got another email from Alan in Cheltenham, UK. Says I just thought some of your viewers might like to know that Orphan Black season one just premiered in the UK. For the first time, the BBC has just decided that we should get to see this show created by its daughter network across the pond. The first episode is up on iPlayer now for people geolocated in the UK. And he says you are now forgiven for calling it a BBC show when the BBC had never shown it. Tongue sticky out, letter P. Keep doing what you do. You're the best, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did. did. Did you know that it was only BBC America? I did not know that at all. Yeah, well, I thought it was also in Canada. Um, I didn't think, it, I, th I thought it was North America only. I don't know if you know, Fraser, whether Orphan Black showed up there or not. I right don't know. But have you, have you Continuum's another example of that. Have you guys seen that show? Because it's I a know. Canadian show that- A, a Vancouver show set in Vancouver. So yeah, they don't I know, to, I know. And like they're all not my there. Local, yeah, all my local haunts there, yeah. 
but, but yeah, yeah so whenever I, like Robson Street and they're not trying to hide the the sign, I kind of give a little cheer. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Dread earlier. That was done in South Africa. I mean, it's great to see these worldwide, you know, various, you know, shows showing up in one place and being shown in another place and showing that there's this worldwide demand for this worldwide creation of media. Again, well, and, uh, the inevitable future. Let's just get there. I, I also like Frazier and tell me if, if, if I'm alone in this, but like I, I like the fact that it forces um, viewers, casual consumers of this content to take a, a more multicultural attitude towards the world. You know, the fact that that District 9 didn't need to be set in in Johannesburg, you know, but but like all of a sudden it brought this part of the world that 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 was a black void to most of the popcorn chewing public and made it a real place to them. I think is good for all of us in the long term, regardless. You know what else is good for all of us in the long term, regardless, Brian? Having Fraser Kane on frame rate, uh, absolutely stellar having you along today, man. Oh, I see what you did there. You were uh, fantastic. Oh, I see. Thanks oh, wow. for having. I, me, I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, okay, uh, okay. I am a huge fan of the show. I love it. And so that's why maybe it's boiled into my DNA now that I can have this conversation. But this is the first time I've actually seen all the bumpers because I usually just listen to it as a podcast. So it's oh. great to actually see all of the, the clips and stuff. So no, it's a terrific show that you guys are doing. And I'm, and I'm really glad that I could participate. And if I, you know, could somehow participate in the, uh, uh, the movie draft at some point, that'd be all right. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, well, talk to Mr. Schwood there. He's the casting. All right. Look, I, I accept the bribes couch. just like any other fine gentlemen. Uh, no, seriously, thank you so much, Frazier. You absolutely nailed it. It's clear. You totally get the voice of the show, man. Thanks so much for coming on. And so Glad people who don't understand what I did there, tell them about Universe Today and where they could find it. Sure. So Universe Today is one of the uh, largest space and astronomy news websites, and I am the publisher. And uh, you can go to universetoday.com and find out all the news about the rockets launching and photos from the Hubble Space Telescope and interviews with astronauts. And yeah, we do all kinds of stuff. Do go do that, universetoday.com. You can also email us. Brian, do we have an email address? Ah, uh, we got a few. You can do fr at twit.tv, framerate at twit.tv, or framerate show at gmail.com. Take your pick. Ooh, go old school with the Gmail they all, if you want. <laughs> Although I will say this, um, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, I pretty much read it, uh, read all the stories uh, on Monday morning, usually before we go live. So that's what I do early on. So uh, if, if you feel like you have a story on Sunday afternoon, you're not too late. That's the best time to forward it over to us. You can also find us on the web at twit.tv slash FR. And we are live every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can join in on the chat room and, you know, talk to me when I get Craig Ferguson and Colin Ferguson mixed up. Do that. <laughs> See you next time. All right, do we just dive right into the uh, spoiler zone? Let's start spoiling. All right, let's do it now. Silent Green is people! Oh! All right, we do, we do need to give a moment for those of you in the audience, as well as our producer, Jason Howell. Yeah, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> to get out of the room. <laughs> here, here comes Patrick. All right, bye. Yeah. Because we are going to spoil the crap out of this one. Let me tell you, this was... A, this was an okay episode. Did you guys like it? I thought it was all right. You guys? Last I'm, week, I'm holding this back, one. Tom, I'm going to let sure. you go first. I'm just wait. I'm waiting until we get the high sign that Jason is safely out of the room and everybody else is. I just themselves. can't believe that it turned out that Walt was an alien the entire time. That's right. About How did they tie the that shark? into X Files? That, that was so <laughs> weird. All right. I think that this is possibly the best episode that they have done. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. I, I totally saw it coming uh, with them with them getting rid of Hank, uh, but I still I still thought that, that that was good. I can already see you guys totally disagree with me. I I, I felt like the uh, the the knife fight was out of nowhere. I didn't know what was going to happen next there, and uh, I think that we have finally Vince Gilligan has finally beat me over the head enough that I understand that Walt is not a good guy, and that's what's going on here. Why do you guys not like this? Uh, oh, yeah. First of all, let, let, let me just say, like, this episode was directed by Ryan Johnson, the guy who did Looper and is a fantastic director. And the symbolism was amazing. I love the fact that every time they cut to that knife, like they showed that knife and phone side by side over and over and really over again. And when you get to that, that scene, 
you're like, oh shoot, there's a choice. She can call 911 or 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 grab the knife. And it's like, that was great. That was laid out as a trap. Personally, I felt like there was deep structural problems with this one in that there were so many things that we knew. The only time there was a genuine mystery was when in the first act. The first act was extraordinary. We got to find out it was a, a great climax. Hank went out like a freaking boss, dude. Amazing and 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 how everything went. Uh after that, though, the next 40 minutes, we knew that Hank ends up on the run. Or I'm sorry, we know that Walt ends up on the run. We know that clearly he's not with himself, so we know his family's not going to be there. We knew that uh, when Marie comes in to gloat and 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 tell uh, uh, tell Skylar how it's going to be, we know that she's got no teeth. Like, there was no teeth in the entire last 40 minutes of that, and that really that really ruined it for me. I, I found myself... Kind of, kind of surf another getting caught up on email during that part, which I'd hate to say, and and I don't know if that's on me. I mean, what, what, what's your take, Frazier? Well, last week, so this is the thing. Last week's episode, I was raving to my friends that breaking that Breaking Bad is, you know, we all do it's the best television show ever made. Blah blah blah. And last week's episode was, in my opinion, the finest piece of television, finest hour of television that's ever been made, that I've ever experienced, that that I was on the edge of my seat from the beginning to the end, and the pacing was perfect, and the way the story played out was perfect, and you get these realizations in your mind, you're like, oh no, at the moment, they start to matter, but you don't get them before they start to matter, and so it just felt like someone was, was just punching you in the dark the whole show long, and I loved it. Um, but with this week's episode, it just didn't, as you said, it just didn't feel as tight. And so it was still a terrific episode from the greatest television show ever made. It just wasn't as good as last week's episode. So, so like you, I wasn't in just, I don't know, I wasn't just enthralled the way I was the previous week. And I can never go back there. That was, you know, that show well, okay. is long gone now, the, you know, but it was just something. It was like a, I've the, never had that experience word- with a television show before. The word that popped into my mind was fulfillment. Um, it was 40 minutes of fulfillment. We've been made promises about, about Walt ending up, uh, you know, on his own. We've been made promises, uh, you know, here's the way I would phrase it is there were really only two questions that entire last 20 minutes or 40 minutes. Well, like, would Skylar get killed and would Jesse Pinkman get killed? And we got answers to those uh, of, of a sort. But but I uh, that's not where we spent the most of our time, and and that's a real bummer to me. I I think you guys are both nuts. I think I thought, I thought it was a <laughs> well, but, freaking thrill you know, ride. But it's like you know, but, it's, you I know, mean, literally, I, it is the- I like bad <laughs> wine too. So you know, whatever, I don't care. I I I thought the scene with uh, Walt Jr. in the in the car wash was something that I didn't ever want to see. And I kind of knew it was coming, but I, I didn't want to see his world come sh- crashing down. And that was good. I thought the scene in the house with the knife, I didn't expect. I didn't. I wasn't bored when she pulls out that knife and she cuts him. No, and then and, and he that, almost that kills her. Me. And then Walt Jr. leaps on him. And you're like, well, now is Walt Jr. going to die? Who, like, who's that, getting stabbed? That, I was totally yeah. guessing through that whole thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I also felt like it kind of hit us over the head. And then he took the like, baby? Did you expect him to take the baby? What was he going to do with the baby? Why but, did but he again, take the baby? But, but again, we we knew we we saw the scene. We know he doesn't keep the baby, so it's like so he goes off in a huff with the baby, and then like I was completely unsurprised five minutes later when he decides to drop it off at at, at a, a fire truck. You know, it's like uh, it's 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 it lacked teeth, and part of that is is just the structure that's been built all around this episode. There were only certain things that it could do, and I felt like. Uh, and again, it was exquisitely told. Everybody acted right, except for maybe Walt Jr. Uh, wasn't maybe the best. But uh, but 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 the, the Anna Gunn was amazing as Skylar. The direction was great. The sim- symbolism was awesome. I love the fact that it started where it all began and came back right to there. There's all these reasons that stuff's great. Um, it, but on the flip side, like it's just out of it's out of place for Walt to go so far out of his way to tell. Pinkman, I mean the audience, how bad a person he is, you know? And it's like, it just, for for a show that has shown so much strength in its subtlety, I saw precious little of it in last night's episode. But I, think I thought, if he had I kept thought the that baby, was right. Oh, go ahead, Frisch. If he had kept the baby, that would have freaked me right out. 
Like I think yeah. when he dropped the baby off with the fire department and then you're like, okay, so now the stakes are some, something's going to catch up with him. Pinkman's in, a, in trouble. But if he had kept the baby, that would have kept the stakes pretty high. And, and I would have had, you know, not like I I'm see him as the good guy anymore by a long shot uh, if I ever did. But, but that would have freaked me right out and just kept me right on the edge of the seat. So I think that was a – I don't know whether that was – I'm sure he's got some plan for the story. But I think that would have really brought it around. Now, we also know that that house is going to get trashed and Heisenberg is going to get spray painted on the wall. So we, that, to me, that's like, okay, how do we get there? Who is he going to use that ricin against? What, what's the point there? The, those are all mysteries that have yet to be determined. But one, one debate that's going on in the chat room right now I want to get your guys' opinion on. And this is a debate that I've seen kind of raging across the internet. Did Walt call Skyler and rip her a new one on purpose to absolve her? Or was he just that angry? They certainly played it as though he was that angry. And that's what annoyed me is that um, is that it was an astonishingly dumb. But we've seen and I understand they're trying to portray, you know, hubris. But but we've seen some astonishingly dumb moves from somebody whose entire character is being, uh, you know, amazingly brilliant. That's pretty smart, actually. Yeah, because because he she can't be complicit in it. And so if he takes the baby and and runs away, then she's totally off the hook and it appears to be, you know, under the control of a madman. So that's that's a really good observation, actually. Wow. Uh, and Bill Meeks says, uh, he's, uh, Vince Gilligan said on a podcast today that Walt called to get Skylar off the hook. So that kind of settles that. Uh, well, shoot. I that's way more clever than now I feel like a, a dumb, poorly informed viewer. <laughs> also, did anyone notice Walt's pants? Apparently no. when he's rolling when oh, he's rolling the money through the desert, he passes his pants. There's a screen there's oh, a screen you know cap what? of it. Somebody I didn't pointed notice that out to me. I didn't notice it while I, I was watching, but I saw the screenshot later. Yeah, when I saw the screenshot, I was kind of bummed out like that. That that's that <sighs> Star Wars small universe problem where it's like, I'm sure that seemed real clever on the page, but it, it, uh, that's the kind of thing that takes me out of a story like this. Like when R2-D2 is in the battle, you know, because the visual effects people want, you don't, I love that. I mean, the pants would be there. That's continuity. That didn't take me out of it at all. He's in that same area where that happened. Did, they they hit you over the head with that at the beginning, which didn't actually occur to me. I saw the pants, but it didn't occur to me that that's what they were. Those were his? Oh, see, I didn't even notice them at all. That's so funny. do you think uh, if he let Skylar off the hook with that call on purpose, did he let Pinkman off the hook? When he told Pinkman, he like this, because when he when he called Jesse, when Jared Jesse called him, he bitched Jesse out in a way that said like, oh, "You're cooperating with the feds. I'm going to take all the blame here." Dude, I don't know, but Pinkman is the new Reek. That's for damn sure. <laughs> like that's all I can think of about yeah. his sad existence uh, to extract uh, the knowledge out of Pinkman. And Walt Bring gave them the word to pull the trigger. So I mean. It's not like Walt's doing Jesse any favors anymore. He he told the the Nazi to pull the trigger and kill him. So that's done. Yeah, but he may Walt's a clever guy. He may have known that that wouldn't happen. Why he tells them about Jane, I I, I want to see an explanation of that still. Because Here's the explanation the other weird that he thing. is just I mean, here don't forget we had this whole subplot about him missing out on becoming rich. Yes. Uh, and, well, and and this, that's this is part of Walt's character has always been I am the one that nobody understands and I am the one that nobody respects and I'm the only one who ever does the right thing and I'm the one who gets left out because of the because of the choices I make. So I was feeling like, until I heard from Bill Meeks in the chat room here, that all of this was just Walt isolating himself with that attitude of like, you all have never understood me and I'm the only one who's who's doing right here. But maybe he's actually being more calculating than that. Maybe he does ha has always had an end game in mind because he's dying. And he knows well, he's not going to live through this. So here's the question is, what is his motivation now? Up until this point, his motivation has always been, whatever happens to me, who cares? I'm damned. I've made a deal with the devil. And I understand that I'm broken and destroyed. But in exchange, I know that my, my, my kids will be able to eat for the rest of their lives. Uh, that's out of the picture now because he's being thrown out by by his girl and, you know, obviously a very polarizing incident with the family. And, and we haven't seen whether or not he can love them so much to allow them to hate him. 
I, I, I don't know. And, and so, so I'm left with the impression that this is the, uh, uh, as they're, as they're promoting it, the, the Ozymandias, uh, remember my name, you know, this guy who wants to make his mark on history instead. Yeah. So, I mean, it's so interesting, like what's next when, if he does get in the car and, and in the van and does head off to, to hide and Jesse, as you said, it's, it, you know, is reek in the, uh, in the meth lab, uh, what's left to resolve it it all feels wrapped up at this point in horrible well, ways the next episode's called the granite state that is the state motto of new hampshire the car he was driving right. in the first episode had hampshire plates maybe we're going to see what happens in new hampshire see and yeah. now i guess this is the other thing too is is knowing that he goes to new hampshire the the one thing from the motivations that we've seen from him in general the hardest thing for me to buy would be him going to new hampshire and just staying quiet that whole time. It seems like once he has nothing to lose, he's driven to make his mark. And it just seems like he would start a new franchise up in that area. But it doesn't look like there's any indication that that's the case. But it now, just feels he, he, luxurious at this point, though. Like, it feels like like when we went through Lost and we went through where they just uh, we went through, uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica, where they just at the end realized that they had all these loose ends. That Like, why does the statue have three toes, right? Like, how are you going to wrap this stuff up and they but in in this show he's been wrapping these things up with so much time that here we are with a few loose ends that need to really get figured out but i don't feel like i can't imagine how it's all going to get resolved that, well, and that, i guess that's that's the real benefit of great. an episode and 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 while i was disappointed slightly in 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 this episode in that so much of it was just tying up the loose ends and dealing with information that we already knew but we are at a point now where we have this kind of tabula rasa all over again like literally he could go off and create a cult up in new hampshire and i'll buy that because they've answered all the questions they've gotten us there in a logical way no i disagree the whole point of this entire run for walter has been to leave money or his family. And unless what he does in these last two episodes is aimed in that direction, none of his story makes sense to me. So he is going to be doing something to make sure that money gets to Holly and Walt Jr., at least, if not Skyler. Right. Except for the horrible consequences of his actions and that things don't always turn out the way you hope. And that's the terrible tragedy of the story. Sure, right. And no, exactly. Yeah. He may not succeed at it. I'm just saying, yeah. like, that's that's got to be where he continues to go. Or this doesn't make sense. Or give everybody rice and... and I think he's going to poison <laughs> Lydia. Rice in the world! Yeah. He's going to rice, rice in himself. Lydia. Rice in himself. Hey, how great was the subtlety of mm -hmm. uh, of of Jesse Pinkman walking down his, his train track to see just the subtlety of just this surveillance photo of the the girl and daughter that he that he's in love with or oh, the, yeah. the girl and son i mean it was that it was like it was like just the implied threat is all it took yeah that was that was what good. do you what do you think about this just on the chat room what do you think about this idea of the gotta call saul have you heard about this oh right the spinoff I, the spinoff yeah is, has it been officially I, announced i know it's been teased yeah. as a possible idea no yeah. apparently it's in production um i could be wrong about that i, I didn't source that but i read Man. something that said that that just so goes back to what I said earlier, which is if it's bad, it will take away from Breaking Bad. No, well, it won't take away from Breaking Bad for me. But if it's bad, it will just kind of be extra disappointing that they even tried it. It'll take away from Vince Gilligan, I guess, is what it'll take but away from me. Because I I can see a spinoff of Bob Odenkirk's character and and kind of being a procedural of, you know, these different crimes a week in the in the pre-days. Uh, and that that being very good, but calling it "Gotta Call Saul" doesn't uh, that like sets the right tone. It that sets the wrong tone it. for me. You created the yeah, finest story know. on television ever told. Stick a bow in it. Move on to a new project. This is well, the same the, guy who made not, the Lone Gunman after the X Files or during the X Files. Mm. So yeah. it might be something like that. <sighs> I was all positive yeah. he said that, way, Delahanty. Sorry. People people in the chat are saying, like, spinoffs are never as good as the original. Uh, let me remind you that The Simpsons was a spinoff of The Tracy Ullman Show. Uh, Frasier was a spinoff of Cheers. Benson was a spinoff of, uh, of Soap. Uh, uh, soap. Uh, the Facts of Life was a spinoff of Different Strokes. It's like, look, there's plenty of... There's plenty of opportunity to make sure, this. Sure, but the intended effect of a spinoff to, to end up with more money, I guess, 
often backfires, or maybe it doesn't. I'm not sure, but but the point is that it doesn't always create better media. It more often yeah. creates poor media. There you are, can cherry pick are, all you like, Schwood. Your after I'll tell you what, those opposites can be. Pointed I'll tell you out what, well. though, man. I would love to. I would totally watch a show, Breaking Bad style, about a young, uh, um, starry-eyed uh, uh, Saul Goodman who just becomes piece by piece corrupt and broken and a coward. To, to, to oh, see really? this man no. that we see. Oh, I would hate. No, that sounds horrible. I don't want to see but, that. That sounds preachy. Yeah, but, but I want to see gonna be Saul being to Saul with people. That when, when, when that character comes on, I love it an extra little bit because it's this whole different aspect of things. And I want, I'm excited about seeing that explored. I don't want to see. Yeah, well, the problem is, 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 is Saul is comedy relief in this show because he's a joke of a character at this point. He's, he's, he's a sad shell of a man who will do anything for a buck. Uh, that is not meat. That is icing. Uh, that is something to distract you from the horrible degradation that we're watching of of Walter White. Uh, so if we want to get something out of the Saul Goodman story, we need icing. to see another. Uh, we need to see a meat story of, uh, and and it can't just all be the cartoon. Doesn't have to be a meat story. There's room for for cake. Just don't put the icing on the meat. I think that's what you're saying. I, I, I just want to see what whatever Vince Gilligan <laughs> wants to do next. So. You know, with not your meat cake. Yeah, uh, no meat cake. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you there. I, we're all in agreement there. Like, just think. follow the creator. Like, if you have these people who come up with these creative ideas and they're the heart of these shows and whatever they do, I trust them to do the next thing. And they may leave spinoffs in their wake and they may or may not suck um, because other just good creators come on board. Just do stuff that sucks. I think you yeah. said it earlier perfectly well. I, I'm yeah. totally with you there. But I think someone should drop piles of money on Vince Gilligan and say, do whatever you want. We don't don't even tell us. Just come back when it's done. We trust yeah. you. Agreed. Go do it, Vince. So right, meat that's, cake. The, that's the title of the show, right? That's the title of the spoiler zone for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody for watching the spoiler zone. We'll see you later. Bye. We always have a, a soft end to the spoiler zone. That's fine. Everyone knows that's coming. Uh dude, uh Frazier, you were amazing. Thank you so much for, for reaching out to us and, and joining 100%. us, dude. That was awesome. I'm, I, 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 one thing I wanted to mention to you guys at some point was, uh, uh, I, you know, I have a few totally wild theories about how to solve the uh, the new media problem. So at some point, uh, you know, we can get into that. Yeah. Well, like for example, right? So like we're, I was thinking, I'm in, I may look like I'm in Canada, but I'm actually in Austin right now, Brian. And I thought we Wait, get you're in and Austin. Watch the yeah, we're gonna watch the movies. No, I'm in Canada. No, I am. I've been oh, in Austin, but okay. no. But tonight, we're gonna come by. We're gonna rent some movies from iTunes, right? We got two choices here. Right, we're gonna either watch the new Avengers movie, or sorry, we're gonna watch Avengers, or maybe watch the new Star Trek movie, or we can watch Troll Two. They're the same price on iTunes. Like, why do we not have a marketplace on, you know, that makes sense. in yeah, iTunes yeah, yeah. that makes sense where where people can go and and so the problem is you get this one size fits all pricing model that doesn't exist in any other world except for media for some reason the worst movie ever made not the star trek is the best movie ever made but the point being like right. is the same price as a as a modern movie like or you know like well you know, and see this is not the angle i thought you were going to go because uh like there is um i wonder if like i would pay 50 dollars for the ability to stream troll 2 to 500 people on justin.tv for the ability to to play it and comment and host a party where we watch it together, where it's like you, where it's like yes, okay, I'm paying for a license to watch Troll Two, but it's like like th th there's that gulf when it comes to licensing. It's like it starts at five hundred, a thousand dollars, something that would be ridiculous, and they wouldn't let you do over the live stream. But but to have the opportunity to solve uh, essentially the uh, 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 oh why can I why am I blanking on the name of what the Mystery Science Theater guys are doing now? Um, Rift tracks, uh, rift tracks, rift yeah. tracks, or right. cinematic Titanic, the, both of them. Right, exactly. Yeah. To, to 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 solve that problem with the, with the live streaming. I mean, I think I think there's a bunch of uh, you know most of what we do right now is on established recorded media. But I have a feeling that three years from now, frame rate's going to be talking a lot about the live streaming space and how malleable that is. Yeah, and I think the the other thing is is like if you're a distribution platform, if you're Netflix or if you're Google or whatever, they always try to have these conversations with the content owners. But that I think is is insane. I mean, that is where your dreams go to die. You know, you go and you have these conversations with CBS or NBC. Like, how much can we buy? 
the new girl for on our streaming media and they'll just they'll just stick the screwdriver in you and just keep ratcheting until you're out of money. And I think if I was Google Play or if I was iTunes or whatever, I would say there's the marketplace. Upload your stuff to it, set your price, we'll take a cut. If you don't want to do it, there's the door. And well, I'm and amazed. Right, the reason that that's not happening is because right now we're just getting to equilibrium. Before now, it was trying to get the networks to agree to give you anything at all. So in that case, you say, yeah, we'll sell Troll 2 for $2.99. We, don't, we just need to get the stuff out here. And Netflix got to the point, they're like, you know what? If you guys are going to be bitches about this, we're going to go make our own originals. And, and we're going to yeah. show you that, you know, we can do and, a house of cards. So you better play ball. And that, that is what happened with music. Remember yeah. music, it was all 99 cent tracks at first. And then as... As the, the worm turned, as people, they started to be like, hey, everybody is buying digital. Then Amazon was able to say, you know, we're going to sell some tracks for 89 cents, okay? That's going to happen. It's just a matter of that marketplace moving so that the networks don't feel like they've got them over a barrel anymore. The networks are starting to feel like, oh, we do need to sell digital because that's where the, the customers are now. But like, what is the difference between a comedy special from a comedian or a, a television show or something that is currently posted onto YouTube or, or a documentary or whatever. Like it's all just a piece of media that people may or may not want to buy that could or could not have advertising put into it. There just needs to be a marketplace where this stuff just happens. Like I don't know about you guys, but my Steam account is filled with video games that I've made impulse purchases on because the price was really good. And oh my God, they were yes. bundled no, together. You know what I mean? And, what, and the difference what, it, there is Steam is a mature marketplace. There's – thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people with PCs that are out there wanting to buy things on Steam. Up until just like the last year or two, there haven't been that many people wanting to buy videos and download them onto their TVs. People were still buying DVDs and watching cable television. We have to have and that still are. massive, I mean, that's massive still people in the video, in the online space wanting video before we start to see that kind of competition force the people who are making the videos to change that pricing model. Because right yes. now they can dictate terms. But I'm just Speaking amazed that distribution which, platforms will ever pick up the phone, send an email, sit down for a meeting. Like the conversation should just be, here's our upload service, press the button, set your price, here's the cut. Well, but the we'll thing is the, the networks would say, no thanks, we won't We won't participate then. Fabulous. And you, now, you know, uh, now you don't have a business. Then and you so, make hey, your own do, like Netflix did. Re well, real quick that's on, not on enough. The subject Netflix has to have those other shows to get people to subscribe so that they have enough people to be able to make a house of cards. It's a, it's a chicken egg problem. Uh, real, real quick, since you mentioned steam and you're a fan Frazier, uh, did you see that they're doing this steam family sharing beta? Uh, no, no. You can actually oh, start sharing yeah. separate accounts. You can start sharing it within your family now, which is freaking amazing. People have been asking me which, um, uh, you know, what am I going to be doing next? Like, am I going to get the Xbox One? Am I going to get the PS4? I'm getting a Steam box. Like, that's what I want. Is He's going to be talking about that next week, I yeah. think. And, and in I'm fact, but, but the first console that puts two outputs in their, two television outputs, two HDMI outputs out of their box gets my money. Because I want to put two TVs in my living room. Yes. And I want to be able to play with my kid play my son and not have to have some horrible split screen experience. Like let's just have yes. two screens and let's play on separate controllers. I'll buy whichever one does that. Oh, Steam bad. apparently is going to be like eight screens or something. I don't know. It's, it's mad. Now you got me happen. all excited, Frazier. All right, look, look, you're, you're just getting me all stirred up, sir. Uh, I, I, I got to call it gentlemen. Uh, great job, Frazier. Good talking with you, Tom. Uh, good show, man. It was a good one. Yeah, great show. Thank you guys. All right. Well, thanks for having me guys. All right. Take care, gents. Right.